Hi everybody, I'm Susan Mulvihill. I'm back out in our vegetable garden today because I need to take care of some really important tasks and I've got all kinds of tips to share with you. Maybe my first tip should be to wear a sun hat and sunscreen. I've got very fair skin, it's very sensitive to sunburn, and I need to take good care of myself. And you need to do the same, so keep that in mind. The sun is very intense and it can cause damage in a very short amount of time. Now tip number two is to keep up with the weeding. I know nobody likes to weed, but it is so important for some very good reasons. First of all, weeds compete with our plants that we're growing on purpose for moisture, sunlight, nutrients, and space. But it goes beyond that. Did you know that weeds can also act as alternate hosts for certain types of damaging insect pests? And they can also be host plants for different types of disease pathogens. So those should be some pretty compelling reasons to keep up with those weeds. Now the first bed that I want to tackle is the carrot bed. I've had it covered with bird netting because we have a lot of quail. You can probably hear them in the background. And they love to peck at newly sprouted seeds. So I'm going to take the bird netting off and I want to do weeding and one other task that I'll explain in just a moment. Now you'll recall that I planted the carrot seeds and parsnip seeds a few weeks ago and the carrot seeds germinated great, especially using that burlap method. So if you missed that, be sure to go back to the video to learn more about it. But we'll get this netting out of the way and then it'll be way easier to weed this bed. So the first thing I wanna do in this bed is get rid of these pesky weeds that have come up. Again, for those very important reasons, and you know, you'll find that if you're good about weeding regularly, you'll be able to get it done really quickly. I can actually weed our entire vegetable garden in about an hour. And I'm talking about 27 raised beds. That's because the pathways have bark and landscape fabric on them. And I only need to weed the surface of the beds. So that is a huge time saver. All right, so I'm gonna go through this whole bed and remove any weeds that I can find. My next tip has to do with the importance of thinning your seedlings so they're spaced apart appropriately. And carrots are a perfect example of this. I sowed the seeds quite thickly and now that they are at least three inches tall, it's time for me to space them about three inches apart. The reason this is important is that if you want to harvest those wonderful big roots that carrots form, you have to give them the room to grow. This is a little bit tedious, it doesn't take long, and it is so worth it. Now for other types of seedlings, it's also important to space them appropriately. But we'll start out with carrots and then anything else that I see along the way that needs thinning, I will take care of that right away. The other thing I wanted to mention is that I also planted parsnip seeds while I was planting carrot seeds in a recent video. The parsnip seeds did not germinate very well. I have maybe a dozen of them in the whole row. <laughs> which is not great and our weather has been all over the board. Today it's a little bit chilly, so I've got this jacket on. It has been up to 91, which is way too early for us here in the Northwest. And it's just been fluctuating quite a bit. We're heading back to warm temperatures, and so I'm not too sure if it's worth trying to reseed the parsnips because they don't really germinate well with warm temperatures. So. I'll have to decide what I want to do about that. Okay, I've taken one of the hoops out of the way so you can better see what I'm doing. And this is something you really should do with bare hands so that you can really feel what you're doing. And carrot seedlings are just tiny little things. Now, 
What I'm going to do is just put these pulled carrot seedlings into our compost pile. The reason you can't really replant them or shouldn't is because when you pull them up, it damages their root hairs and that will make it very hard for them to form a normal taproot. So that's why I'm just going to toss them. And as you watch me, you're going to think, wow, that's really tedious. But once I get into the, the mode here, it does get much faster. Now, see, I'm just whipping along now. <laughs> Okay, so that's a start. And when I start thinning, I'm always a little bit conservative, and then I realize that, okay, let's, let's be realistic here, and let's make sure I space them the correct distance. Okay, that task is done. It didn't take all that long. I'm going to put the hoop back in place and the netting. And look who's putting in appearance. This is Ned the chickadee. There you go. So he loves mealworms and it's a great way to form a bond with them. My next tip has to do with the importance of monitoring your garden on a regular basis and preferably daily. For one thing, it's pleasant to stroll through your garden and see how everything is doing. You might come across something really cool like your first ripe tomato or your first zucchini. Or you might come across an insect problem that is just getting started or maybe you notice some leaves on your plants aren't looking so good, maybe that's a disease. And so by monitoring your garden regularly, you can nip problems in the bud way more easily than if you react to a problem much later and you have very few options. So be sure to walk through your garden, again, preferably daily. It's something that gives me great joy and I'm keeping an eye on how all the plants are doing. You'll recall we're growing our potatoes in cloth grow bags. There's actually 10 bags all together, and we're growing five bags of Yukon Gem and five bags of Elba. Now, the important thing to remember is that as the plants grow up, you want to keep filling in the soil around them. So you can use potting soil for this, compost, a mix of the two, and the important thing you want to remember also is that if you have any potatoes that are developing near the soil surface, when the sun's rays hit them, the potatoes form a natural substance called solanine. And if you eat enough of it, it is toxic. So I don't want that to happen. And when you see a green potato, that's what's happened. So I also want to make sure that if there are any potatoes that are starting to develop at the soil surface, I put down either more soil or some grass clippings from our lawn because we don't use any herbicides, so they're safe to use. So that's the next task on my list today. Now, as you look around our garden, you're probably seeing an awful lot of floating row cover. 
and you know it does work well for frost protection but our season is kind of on a fast forward mode because it has warmed up much earlier than usual so what I'm actually doing is protecting some of our very young tender seedlings from California quail we have all of these wonderful birds in our yard we love watching them but they do love to nibble on freshly sprouted seeds and tender young seedlings. So things like squash, carrots, lettuce, and bush beans. So what I'm doing is I have different types of covers to keep them away just while the seedlings are really young and tender. So I just want to show you some things that I'm doing because it illustrates how you have to be creative in thinking of ways to keep them away from your plants just until they get a little tougher. In this bed, I'm growing a bunch of different types of flowers plus an artichoke plant. And I'm not so worried about the artichoke, but boy, do they like to peck on sunflower leaves. And actually, it's just about time for me to remove this chicken wire cage. And I also have some chicken wire cloches over some snapdragons and some zinnias. So pretty much everything in this bed is probably far enough past that tender stage that I can take these barriers out of the way. Now all of these came from Gardener's Supply, really well made. I don't have an affiliation with them, but I do really like their products and these are a great example of that. Now in the hoop house, I'm growing watermelons over here and was so worried about their tender leaves. And so look what I did. I've just got some weed block fabric it's about two feet high and I just stapled them on here so I can step over them but it's one of those things that if you think about quail they are ground dwelling I mean they do fly but if they're walking along on the ground they're not going to know what's on the other side of this barrier so each of the doorways in the hoop house is protected by these little barriers. Here's another example. It was tricky to protect these pumpkin plants because of our arbor, but all I did was I put some hoops through it and then just put some pieces of floating row cover up high enough so that as they're walking along on the ground, they can't see the plants in here. And I'll probably just leave that in place for another week or so. What about plants that are out in the open? Well, first of all, you probably know that I like to use these toy snakes from the dollar store as a little bit of a scare tactic, and it does work quite well. It's important to move them around every few days. And then I've also just taken some old pruned branches and put them around these celery plants. I've got six of them in this bed. And so it's a physical barrier that Hopefully, they can't get through them to peck on the leaves. Now, what's behind them is our pole beans, because this is our pole bean arbor. And if you just look at the little silhouette, you can see that they're growing inside. And I want to give them about another week's worth of protection. So I'm just using some strips of floating row cover and clothespins to hold them in place for a little bit longer. Now, this bed is completely covered using hoops and floating row cover and it's protecting my zucchini seedlings and also the seedlings of the new bush type of butternut squash that I'm growing in here. And they're doing great in there, so probably these can come off in about a week. This is one of our onion beds, and here's another example of strategies. It's a little hard to look at, but I've got some flash tape in there and also some pinwheels. So the pinwheels are going to move and make a little bit of a sound as they're moving. And of course the flash tape is moving and reflecting light in different ways. And what happened is some quail decided that those tiny little onion seedlings that I started using the winter sowing method were quite tasty. I was thinking nothing would eat onions, but anyway, they are now growing great, and I think we're about ready to take that off and remove the last of the hoops. And here's one last strategy I'm using. And you know, it's not pretty, but hey, if it works, it's a great temporary fix. So in here, I have sunflower seedlings and marigold seedlings. And initially, I didn't really give them a whole lot of protection, just some of these branches. 
and I came out to the garden probably the day after I planted them and I saw some peck marks on some of the sunflower leaves and I thought, oh you little stinkers. So what I did is I added some more branches and then I had a narrow strip of floating row cover that I put around the perimeter. It's another one of those situations where if they're walking around they can't see inside and know that there are yummy plants in there. So this is just about ready to be removed. But you know, when it comes to dealing with critters, you have to be creative. So now you can see the types of strategies I use, especially for dealing with birds. But no matter what type of critter you're dealing with, it's best to put something into place first and anticipate a problem, and then hopefully not have any problems at all. So I hope all of this information was helpful today, especially the various tips. And how about next week, we'll walk through the garden bed by bed. I'll show you how things are coming along, mention any next steps that need to be done, and so on. Thanks so much for watching today, everybody. I'll see you next week. Happy gardening.